Nick Foss Beach 23 years ago. I'd been invited by a friend to speak at a high school event for his church. Nick and his wife, Rochelle, were working as leaders there, and um, as cautious as I was about who I let close to me, I was immediately at ease around them both. Humility and loyalty have a way of opening locked doors. In 10 years since we've been together as a church, Nick and Rochelle have served fully. God has gifted Nick with practical insight for believers <clears throat> in an undying fire for those who don't feel at ease in church. Nick is a peacemaker, not a peacekeeper. His aim in making us reconsider some long-held habits and biased beliefs as Christians to make sure the great news of Christ's affection and resurrection every day. Nick is a pastor and a shepherd of our ragtag, ragamuffin flock. Shepherds don't negotiate with wolves. They confront them. Nick says and does whatever will expose wolves in the garden while keeping the gates of God's love wide open. It's his gift from God to the world. Would you please open your minds, turn your attention, and join me in welcoming your brother in Christ, Nick Pospich. Yeah. Is this a golf game? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to read that again. I'm just kidding. Good morning, y'all. Good morning. Good morning. How are we doing today? Yeah. Yeah? Good. So I've got a ton. You're doing super good. That's good to hear. I've got a ton to get through today. Um, it has been a while since I've been up here speaking to you. And um, last time was on video, uh, right as the, the pandemic was starting to get in gear. And um, we're going to kind of pick right back up there. Um, but first, I have a couple things I want to ask you. So today, you are going to hear some things you are not going to like to hear. I will virtually guarantee that, whether you're Republican or Democrat, whether you hold strict uh, beliefs about certain things in the Bible that you will not put down, there are going to be things here today that you're not going to be happy about. And I'm going to ask you to do something for me. There's something called confirmation bias. And what confirmation bias is that we all have ideas that we hold very strong to. So let's go find articles and things that support your idea that the Clintons are crooks, right? And if you think that Donald Trump is a, there's lots of words I could fill there, you go find things that will verify that yes, indeed, he is a complete jerk. That's how you believe. I have a confirmation bias about the Detroit Lions. I am completely certain, 100% certain that the NFL wants them not to win. I watch play after play and terrible calls be made all the time. And I ignore the fact that it happens with other teams. Right? I just see it when it happens to the Lions. So when somebody talks about other teams getting a bad call, my, my initial response is, yeah, but did you see this one? Right? Because I have a confirmation bias, and I look for things that support what I already believe, and then I say, see, I told you. So today, I want you to put those aside. I want you to take the things that you think you know and be willing for just a little bit to open your ears to something different. So... I ask you guys try your hardest and remind yourself as you're starting to get fired up that perhaps it's confirmation bias. And just keep rolling with me. Because afterwards, when we're all said and done, you can tell me what you're thinking. But stick with me here. So where we're going to start today is the beginning of the pandemic. I had a chance to talk to you guys on video. And one of the things that I thought was interesting about this pandemic is that for years... Um, I have heard in Christian circles this idea that we want to pray for revival. Who has been a Christian for a long time who knows this discussion, right? We hear this all the time. Pray for revival. Pray for revival. Man, we wish God would do something to change something. And so I looked at the pandemic maybe a little bit differently than others because I thought maybe this is an answer to a prayer about the revival that we've been asking for 
since I was a kid in the 80s. And I thought, man, what a cool opportunity for Christians to step into this gap of unknown, of fear, of hurt, and of pain, and to say, we could be an answer to that. We have Jesus. We have this answer that could bring peace to this whole unknown situation. But unfortunately, what I saw didn't reflect what I hoped for. And so you remember, if you saw the video that I talked about on my Facebook feed, good Christian people that I love and I know love Jesus would talk about Whitmer and they would call her Hitler. And I saw people who would talk about Trump and his response, and they would call him a lot of words I can't say in church. And I hope I don't say it today, because I'm kind of fired up, so you never know. <laughs> so forgive me in advance if I drop some your word that you didn't expect. And kids, don't say them. <laughs> But Jesus will forgive me the right. I was fired up, right? Because I watched this response and thought, why are we wasting our opportunity? This is what we prayed for, for all this time. We have this opportunity to do something, and you're wasting your time fighting about masks. You're wasting your time fighting about this person who's a Democrat or Republican. This has nothing to do with any of it. And it was frustrating. And then we moved on to our racial issues. So we moved right from pandemic right on to our racial issues. And... Listen, I'll tell you, I grew up in a situation where there wasn't video. When I was young, there was nothing, but I do remember one video. I remember this video of Rodney King, a black man being beat down in the street by police. And it wasn't okay. And I watched, I listened to NWA talk about their feelings in regards to the police and what the police may, could, may be able to do that I can't say. And he started having a feeling that Something isn't right in this community. Something is not okay when these people are oppressed and beat down in ways that others maybe aren't. And so as we move into the now, we start seeing all these other things that happen. We see George Floyd. We see Jacob Blake. We see Breonna Taylor. We see all these people who are suffering an injustice. And I think, now here is the chance for Christians to step in the gap and say, Hey, there are always extenuating circumstances, but what we do know is that Jesus loves people of color just like he loves us. The message of hope is for them. How could we be an answer in this situation? How can we step into this and provide hope and not just rely on a system that seems to oppress? But instead, what I saw was my Christian friends on Facebook yelling about BLM and saying, this isn't okay because they want to turn us into socialists and all that kind of stuff, and ignoring the whole fact that there is a piece of things that are set up are not equal, and instead of doing the research to find out why anybody might even say them what they believe. Well, it is fair because we abolish slavery. You don't have to work hard to figure out why it's not fair. It's not hard to do if you're willing to put aside your confirmation bias. You can find out that it's not equal. But a lot of people don't do this. And I see another opportunity that we let slip through our fingers as Christians. Another opportunity where we could have been hope in the world where we threw stones. And then I think, so here's the election. Here's, here's a wonderful chance to step into the gap as Christians and say, hey, we know that our hope comes from Jesus, not from Joe Biden or Donald Trump, just from Jesus. And when the election happens, we have a chance to provide that message Two people that we are full of hope either way. And I think God's got a crazy sense of humor that he schedules me on the week after we have this craziness on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> but I kind of do. I complained about Black Lives Matter and how, hey, they shouldn't be rioting. They just rally. I go, and what I see is this. Republicans equal rally. Democrats equal right. I see a post from a pro-life individual named Abby Johnson, and some of you may know who she is. And in her post, the discussions about Black Lives Matter and Antifa and how they were the ones who started the riot. And I think this is completely ridiculous. So even in a situation where the opposite side, the people who were throwing stones at all these people rioting are now doing the same thing they were throwing stones about, they're still going to blame it on people of color. They're still going to blame it on these radical leftists. But it's not true. Even the people who started the riot say, that's not true, I'm not part of Antifa, and yet we still believe they are, because that's what we do, right? We have a confirmation bias. We believe things. 
And so we see this election, a place for Jesus to step in and shine and be the hope of the world. And instead, we sit here fighting with each other about the hope being in a politician, being a political belief. Something has to change. Jesus, a lot of times in the Bible, says, he who has ear, let him hear. Right? Let them hear. And you might say, well, everyone has ears, they should hear. And that is one way to look at this passage, that statement. The other way might be, listen, you have ears, but are you hearing? Are you seeing what's happening? Are you listening to the hurt from people? And are you willing to put aside what you've already believed to hear something true? To hear something different. So today I'm asking you, if you have ears, I want you to hear this. We're going to pick up in the Sermon on the Mount. It's in Matthew 5, and it's 17 throughout the whole section of Matthew 5. And it goes all the way through Matthew 7. And Jesus has been talking, a lot of people have been following Jesus around, Jesus has been talking about some things that um, they must be attractive because they've gathered a crowd, right? There was a lot of teachers of the law. There was a lot of rabbis. There was a lot of Pharisees. They all talked about God. Man, Pharisees, teachers of the law, they loved God. They loved the Bible. They loved Scripture. We can't always just paint these guys as the bad guys. They knew what God said and what God cared about. They knew Scripture really, really well. And yet, something about the way Jesus was teaching was drawing crowds. And so he was one of them, and yet not one of them. And so we pick up, and this is what Jesus said, different message. He says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I didn't come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So Jesus is saying something different, and all these people are hanging on his words, and what he says is, listen, what these Pharisees are saying about the law is true. I didn't come to change the law. I didn't come to put aside the things that God cared about at all. I came to fulfill them, but I didn't decide to put them, put them aside. And the Pharisees, I'm sure, are listening, saying, well, that's not what I thought he was doing. And yet I can agree with that. We shouldn't put aside the law. And then he says, for I tell you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of these Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus begins to drop a bond. He begins to twist things a little bit, right? Because he says to the people, so unless you, who are commoners, who don't know Scripture, are even better than these guys here who do know Scripture, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I think that would be shocking to hear because me as a commoner would say, if they aren't going to get there by their behavior, then how could I possibly have any hope at all? How could I have hope to obey all these rules in a way that I would be able to get into the kingdom of heaven? But then Jesus takes it and just notches it up just a little bit more. He makes the whole situation worse because he says, you've heard it said. Now, the Pharisees had to know what this may mean, and I think the people there had to know what this means because the people saying things were the Pharisees. The people saying things were the teachers of the law. The people saying things were the Christians and the pastors, right? And so Jesus says, you have heard this said. Do not murder. But he follows it up with, but I tell you, so it's interesting, right, because you've heard it said, people quoting the Bible do not, quoting scripture, I should say, do not murder. But I tell you. So Jesus puts himself in a spot of authority to say, I am going to tell you something that's different than scripture. Maybe. He says, if you're even angry, if you insult, if you call people names, you're in the danger of the fire of hell. If you, but you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, if you even look at another person with lustful thoughts, you're in danger of the fire of hell. 
It's better to cut off your or cut out your eye or cut off your hand than go to hell. So Jesus takes this situation that was hopeless enough as it was, right? Because the Pharisees can't be righteous enough, so who's going to get to go to heaven? And he amps it up and says, I'm going to even make this worse. Because if you even think about being angry with somebody, if you're angry with somebody to the point of sin, if you are calling somebody names, if you're insulting other people, you're in danger of hell. He takes it from an action that we do to a thought. He takes the commit adultery and says, if you even look lustfully, suggesting that cut out your eyes, because right, that's how you look, and cut off your hand. And I think a lot of adults here can figure out what he might have been talking about there in regards to lust. Jesus is a little sarcastic. He leaves us with a choice. Because if your righteousness is based on what you do, and based on what you think, there's no hope for anybody. No hope for anybody at all. Because how do any of us not sin all of the time? Who here has called Donald Trump a name? Raise your hand. Just be proud. Who's called him a name? Right? Lots of us. Who's called Hitler a name? Or Whitmer, right? Because you already translated what I said, didn't you? Because all of us have done this. All of us are in danger of the fire of hell if we stop with it. So Jesus leaves a choice with, the, with these folks there. And today, I want to take a look at the Bible. I want to see what we claim to believe. And then I want to decide where do we go from here. <clears throat> In the Old Testament, there were 613 laws. What Jesus is saying is that there are 16, 613 laws that I didn't put aside, that God thinks are really important things. So I'm going to talk about these laws, and I want to ask you how you're doing with some of them. Because we are a Bible church, right? We believe the Bible. We believe that Scripture is correct. So let's take a look at what it says. Uh, this is what God does not like. Do not cut the hair at the sides of your head or clip off the edges of your beard. So is anybody in here without a beard? If you are, you're in trouble. Yeah, not, not the women. I, that's good, though. That's, that's good. But if you know somebody without a beard who is a man and could grow a beard, let's qualify this, it's not okay. Because you're not supposed to cut that. It's what God said. It's what scripture says. <clears throat> do not cut your bodies for the dead. We probably don't do that. Or put tattoo marks on yourself. So, show of hands, how many people have tattoos in this room? A lot of us, right? <laughs> and I want one, but I thank God I read this, because otherwise I was in trouble with hell. So, tattoos, we do this. But the Bible says we shouldn't, right? The Bible's 100% clear we shouldn't do that. It says right here, don't eat any, eat any meat, and this is where I'm in trouble. Do not eat any meat with the blood still in it. I don't even like to cook my steak, so I, I'm in trouble, right, because I have not done this appropriately. But Jesus is left with his choice. We can either obey the rules or, or find righteousness some other way. Do not mate different kinds of animals. Some of you think golden doodles are cute. You're in sin. Do not plant your field with two kinds of seeds. Well, probably none of us are planting two kinds of seeds, but we're eating hybrid food, right? Because it lasts longer. Do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. So all of us softball players who are wearing the poly cotton blends, right to hell. <laughs> Don't go about spreading slander among your people. I could just say President Trump or Governor Whitmer there, and I think we could all be in trouble with that one. Don't curse your father or mother, or you could be put to death. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. If a man lays with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death, their blood is upon them. 
So there are a lot of rules listed in these 613 laws, right? Which of you believe all of those are for today? But that's what Jesus said, right? I didn't come to abolish any of these laws. He didn't come to get rid of any of them. These are the expectations God put in his word, in scripture, to say this is how we measure holiness and righteousness. This is how we earn our salvation. So I guess the question is, does anybody here want to continue to obey scripture for their righteousness with God? Is anybody ready to say that is the way to do this? Because if we are, we've got a lot of work to do. Or is it time to start recognizing our position of humility? Can we realize that coming to Jesus and being humble and accepting his fulfillment of the law is the way to righteousness? See, because Jesus didn't come to eliminate all the rules. He didn't come to say it's a free-for-all, everyone have at it. What Jesus did do was to live a perfect life where he took all those 613 laws and obeyed them. He did the right things. And then he decided to die on a cross for us, right, and, and come back from the dead. So Jesus has risen from the dead, and that penalty for sin is taken and put on him, and that's how we get righteousness. The problem is, is that we live in a hybrid model. We live with this idea that for some things, we just want to totally accept the sacrifice of Jesus, right? So for tattoos and covering your head in church as a woman, because that's in there, no pork, so bacon's out. For those things, we want to say, well, we'll accept Jesus' grace because they don't really matter. But for other things... We pound our fists and say, well, these do matter. And the cross isn't enough to atone for those sins. So I propose to you today that we don't believe what Scripture says. You see, I have a fear always when I come up to preach. When I, when, from the time I was a kid, I've been told that I don't understand God in a way that I need to. I've always had the fear that I'm going to lead you to a slippery slope. All you old Baptists know what it means. That the teaching that I give you is going to lead you into a li liberal view of grace and away from God. But I will contend with you today that we've been on a slippery slope since day one and it has nothing to do with what I say today. <clears throat> the slippery slope that I think we are on is a slope that says there's some people who are better and some people who are worse. That somehow... Our behavior is what pleases God, not the fact that Jesus is our righteousness. And God looks at us through Jesus, and that is it. And our behavior has nothing to do with that position. That's a slippery slope we're on. That's a slippery slope we slid down years and years and years ago. Because the truth is, we're no different than the Pharisees of back then. We're the same exact people trying to earn our salvation and trying to damn those who don't do it the right way. So for me, it started with divorce. I was a little kid, and, man, I probably was early 80s when I kind of started getting this. And listen, my church, the people in my church loved Jesus. They loved God. They did what they were supposed to do, and they really liked the law. And so we had a family there who got divorced. And... I remember seeing how they were kind of pushed to the side. The, get the dad and the mom were pushed to the side. They weren't exactly welcome. They're kind of given the cold shoulder. And anybody who would come and who was divorced would kind of just get pushed to the side. And it was weird to me, but I was a little kid. I didn't know any better, so I thought, well, this must be what it is. Because the Bible says that everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery, right? So 
we have absolute the right to push these people to the side because if they divorce, they're committing they're committing adultery. If they get remarried, it's even worse because they'll never get out of that adultery. They're going to be in the adultery sin until the day they die. And so, I don't know, as a little kid, it made sense to me. But then time passed, and, you know, we didn't really care about that anymore. Because there were so many divorces. So many people married just splitting up. And I remember how the church, eh, it just wasn't that important. And I think what they did is saw the truth, to be honest. I think they made the right decision back in those days and said, okay, you know what, maybe we don't know everything. Maybe there's more to this story than there needs to be, and we're going to give grace. But they weren't following what the Bible said, because the Bible is pretty clear about this. We had a church down the road that required people to wear head coverings. Threw that one out. It's not for today. Piercings. I remember the next issue was piercings. We had, we had a girl who was a, a leader at our church. And she was, uh, I don't know if she's here today. Opal, you around? <laughs> Opal's not here. Of course she's not. Big jerk. She's we, going to we hell. We kicked her out because the nose ring. Oh, we kicked her. Yeah, so, so Opal had a nose ring. Opal was reading the Old Testament. And the Old Testament was talking about this idea that if you put a, a, a phylactery, it was called, on your wrist, what the idea was is to remind you of the words of God. And so Opal decided to get a nose ring so that every time she looked in a mirror, she would see that and think about a, a moment that God had spoken to her. It's supposed to be a reminder for her. And yet, it was the wrong body part to pierce. Because the Old Testament says don't pierce any body parts, but we knew that didn't mean ears. Because ears were totally fine. We decided, well, ears are okay. God's good with the ears, but the nose is a step too far. That bridge is way down the road. And so Opal, we had to have a whole church meeting about the fact that Opal had a nose ring. Today, how many people have piercings that are not in their nose? Just visible ones. I don't want to know about anything else. I mean, most of the time I don't want to know about everything else. There's a bunch of us, right? And yet, in the Bible, what it says, piercings. Don't do it. And then it went to alcohol, the wrong kind of music, and tattoos, I remember asking, why is that a big deal? Because scripture says don't do it, right? So this church I go to is full of people who love Jesus. They care about the law of God. And we made a point of letting people know we care a lot about these rules. And if you're not doing these rules, you're not pleasing God. The problem is, is that we don't just stop there. Neither did the Pharisees. The Pharisees had 613 laws to play with. A lot of them. But they thought, eh, those are good. We should add some. Because if we add some extra laws, then we'll never get close to the, doing the 613. So they just thought, what if we just build a fence around what God said? So here's what God said in the middle. We're going to build a fence all the way around it. And don't ever cross that fence. And then you're going to be fine because you won't sin. We do the same exact thing. Us Bible-believing people, us good people who are demanding that people read the Bible, believe the Bible, do the same exact thing. And here's some proof. So we go to Leviticus. Here's what it says. When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native-born. Love them as yourself. For you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Pretty easy to read, right? Like you see this, God is saying, so hey, when a foreigner comes, you guys remember what it's like. You remember what it's like to live in Egypt and how crappy it was and how they mistreated you and you didn't have enough money for food and your kids were killed for no reason sometimes. It sucked. Just remember that when foreigners come in. Remember what it was like. The problem is, is that in America, we have added some words to this. So let me reread it the way you probably believe it. Some people, when a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them unless they didn't come in by filling out the right papers. Unless they came in illegally, then do what you like. Do whatever you like, right? Because that's what it says. But it doesn't. There is no unless. There's no unless clause here. 
There's a demand to understand you were a foreigner, don't you remember? Don't you remember what you needed to escape? Who was there for you? I knew the Lord your God. But in America, we decided, well, as long as they did it right, it's fine. That's not what the Bible says. That is not what Scripture says. We made up a rule. So what makes me frustrated is I look at this whole Republican-Democrat garbage, and I see the Christians aligning themselves with this group because, the Republicans for the most part, because they stand for life. And you know what? Abortion sucks. It hurts. It's a bad thing. They stand with Republicans because they say, we're for pro-family values. Homosexuality is sin, and so we're not going to go there, and we're going to keep standing there on this. But are the Republicans pro-life, or are they just pro-womb? Because life is not just before you're born. Life is after you're born, too. Where are they standing with the people who exist and breathe today? I guess it's okay to put kids in cages if they didn't come across the border the right way. That's what we support. That's what Jesus is saying is okay. Because it's not okay. It's not okay to cut funding to things like foster care. You can't have an abortion, but hey, let's take money out of the foster care system. How does that make any sense at all? Is that what Jesus is asking of us as Christians to defend? On the other side of the aisle, we have the same exact issues. The same thing. Both these groups of people somehow have become righteous and defending of Jesus when they have nothing to do with Jesus. Jesus isn't political. He is above all of it. To believe somehow that this political system and that live in fear and worry that, well, we didn't think the election was fair. You know what? Maybe it wasn't. Does that change who God is? Does it change at all who God is if the election was stolen? Not even a little itty bit. But you have ceded your power to this imaginary system that somehow doesn't even have supernatural power on its side, and yet somehow this system overrides what God is capable of. That makes no sense at all. No sense. Either God is God, and he's supernatural, and he can do what he wants when he wants to do it, or he's not. You have two options here. We make up rules that we think are important, and then we demand that people follow them. But they're not in the Bible. And then we come to Jesus, right? Because that's an Old Testament rule. And what we know is the Old Testament doesn't matter anymore. Most of the time. Certain rules matter. But then we get to the New Testament. We listen to Jesus. Now one thing I think I want you to think about with Jesus is this. Jesus knows God. Right? Like he knows God like I know Mark. Pastor Mark and I are friends. I know him. So if I tell you something about Mark's character, there's a good chance that I, because I know him, I might have some idea what I'm talking about. Right? Right? So when you think about Jesus, he knows God. He's spent time with God. And so Jesus tells a story about sheep and goats. He says, then the righteous will answer him, Lord. So God, God, what, what God is doing here is Jesus is saying that people will stand in front of God. And God will say, I didn't know you. Go away. You didn't know me. He divides people between sheep and goat. And there's various reasons why, and this is the reasons, but what the righteous, the righteous say, if they, if once they've been divided into this category of sheep, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? And God says, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of the brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. The problem is, is that in America we had the word unless. 
right? Unless there's people who are hungry in the world. There are people who are thirsty in the world. There are people facing oppression and wars and pain and hunger, all these things in the world. And unless they're a threat to us, you know, like those Syrian people that were in that refugee camp, we shouldn't let them in because they're a threat to us, right? Because we need to protect American sovereignty. We need to protect ourselves from the danger. But that's not what this says. It's not what the Bible says. It says, if you went to somebody who's hungry or thirsty, or somebody needed clothes, and you provided those things to them, then you did it for me. It doesn't allow for these little things of safety that we think it allows for. We cannot add to Scripture this way. And yet, good Bible-believing people who will pound their fist about the inerrancy of Scripture will add things to these verses. We all do it. You've never lived in South America. How many people have even been to South America here? Okay, so, you know, when you're down there, it's not like America. You know that when you're down there, there are box cities of people who live in boxes, if you've been to Brazil, and they live right next to rich people. You know that kids don't get food, that they're sitting on the outside, and this is just Brazil. You go to Mexico, and it is horrible. There are drug wars. There's kids being killed for no good reason. This is how it goes. They need to escape. They need a safe haven. And we're there to stand at the border and say, well, that's okay. Boy, you have to do it this way. And if you don't, get out. If they're your kids, is that okay? If they were Americans, is that okay? This is not what the Bible says. This is not at all what the Bible says. And to stand in this position and say, well, this is the way we're supposed to do it, it's not what Jesus says. It's not what the king is going to be happy about. Jesus is with God. Jesus knows God. He says this is what God is like. He probably knows. And then we get to 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And some of you were like that. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. And when I hear that verse, the only thing I hear is, see, homosexuals aren't going to inherit the kingdom of God. It's right there. In black and white. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. I never hear about thieves who won't, hear the kingdom, or won't inherit the kingdom of God. I don't hear about drunkards. I don't hear about greedy people. I don't hear about people who spend their life just partying. I don't hear about anybody who is sexually immoral. And we already had Jesus define what that means, if you even think about it. I don't hear about any of those folks and how they can't inherit the kingdom of God. All I ever hear about is homosexuals and how they won't inherit the kingdom of God. Because we took scripture and said, well, yeah, but. This one's a big deal. These other ones, eh, not a big thing. And we're the people who are supposed to follow this God. We're the people who are supposed to stand in the community and say, Jesus loves you. We're the people who say, this is what the Bible says, and it matters. And yet we disregard the parts we don't like, and call that righteousness. We disregard the parts that we just don't want to obey and say it's okay. It's not just the people who want there to be gay marriage that's okay who do this. It is every single one of us in every single one of our issues. 
we ignore what God says all of the time, and we twist the things to mean what we want them to mean. So we go back to Jesus. Jesus told parables so you'd get what he was saying. And Jesus tells this parable that I love and hate all at the same time. I hate it because I find myself in the wrong position against this parable. And I really wish I didn't. And the parable is about this man who owes some money to a king. The king is God, so let's make this abundantly clear. And this guy owes so much money that there is no way on earth he could ever, ever, ever repay the debt. It's beyond anything you could possibly owe. It's probably like our last stimulus check. Way too big. Not our check, but the other checks. Way too big. No one can possibly pay it back. And he goes to the king, and I want you to catch this. He says to the king, I can't do it. I can't pay this back. And what does the king do? The king forgives him of his debt. Doesn't ask for a penny, doesn't put on a payment plan, doesn't do anything at all but just say, you're forgiven. This is ridiculous grace. Can you catch that? The king has all the rights in the world to kill this guy. He can throw him in prison. He can do whatever he wants. He is the king. What does the king do? The king forgives completely unconditionally. Just forgive him. The king is God. So what does it tell you about the character of God? So what happens with the man? The man walks out, and he is free. And immediately sees somebody in the street who owes him money. And it's not that much. And he throws the guy in prison because he can't pay him back. The reason I don't like this is I do this, right? I have been forgiven for so much I could never repay. It's not even about the things I've done. It's about the things I think. I don't have any way to reach the righteousness of God on my own. I can't do it. But yet, I hold you accountable for the stupid stuff you do. And if you owe me something, I want it. Because I'm this man. So the man goes out, throws this guy in prison, and the king tells him, that's it. The man is ungrateful. He doesn't understand the role of, and position that he had of helplessness before the king did something for him. He was 100% helpless like the rest of us. Nothing we can do to satisfy God. We can try our hardest. We can go and Try to obey those 613 laws. Like Jesus said, none of them are invalid. He didn't come to get rid of any of them. We can obey the version of the Bible that we think is comfortable to us. We can add our unlesses, our ifs, and say, hey, these clauses are good things. And we can do that and try to earn our salvation. Or... We can understand something about us and something about our Savior. You see, Jesus said that even the Pharisees, if your righteousness does not surpass that of the Pharisees, you'll never make it in deed or in thought. Whose righteousness is going to surpass that of the Pharisees? No one. Jesus leaves us with a clear response to this. And the clear response is that we are depraved. Utterly, utterly depraved. Republicans, Democrats, pro-life, pro-abortion, straight people, gay people, white people, black people, we're all completely depraved and in need of a savior. That's the only response we could possibly have to the teachings of Christ. Is to understand that we are desperately in need of a Savior. 
and no good work and no good thing that we do and no addition to scripture to make sure we do super good things is going to change our position. We can't earn anything. We can't earn heaven. We can't earn God's forgiveness by the things we've done. All we can do is say, Jesus, I need you. Because what it says about Jesus is that he became our righteousness. So we don't have to earn our own. And that's how we can be more righteous than the Pharisees. Not because we've done something, but because Jesus did something. Because Jesus obeyed the 613 laws. Because Jesus didn't add things to scripture for kicks and then obey him. Jesus knew his father and obeyed his father and then died as a sacrifice for us so that we didn't have to do it. So Jesus earns our righteousness for us. So my question for you today is this. Why do we continue to demand that everyone else earn their righteousness? Why is Christian people do we block the door of that church building right there so that people can't hear about who Jesus is? Why do we stand for issues that separate us from people who need to hear about Jesus? Because if there's one thing people need, one thing, it's to know Jesus. That's it. This isn't difficult. It's one thing. They don't need to behave appropriately before they know Jesus. They don't need to behave appropriately after they know Jesus. They need to know Jesus. They need to know who he is, what he's done, why it matters, why they need him. And when we stand here with our fists raised saying, we are going to demand that you obey these rules. We're going to stand and shake our fists against gay marriage because the Bible says homosexuality, homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God. When we say these things and ignore the rest of the Bible, we put ourselves in an undefensible position. Because this also says drunkards. Who's been drunk in here? Hey, me. Probably not even that long ago. <laughs> Man, what this says is that I deserve hell. So why is nobody standing out front and yelling about alcohol? Like, why are we not demanding that people don't drink alcohol? Because that's going to get them to fire up hell. Why is it important that we're an all-inclusive church that that welcomes anybody, no matter who they are, no matter you know, where they're at with God, is because this message is the message they need to hear. When we put blockers in front of that door, people never find out about Jesus because we've given them a reason to believe he's not even real in the first place. We've given them a reason to believe that only some people are okay. But that's not the message of Jesus. It's not the message of the Bible. Divorce hurts. People need comfort. They need a place to land where it's safe. A place where other people will love them right where they're at. And hear them. Being ostracized. Because you're attracted to the same sex. Can you imagine how lonely that is? Can you imagine that what you've heard from the church is that I have to live alone my entire life because if I don't, I'm going to go to hell. Can you even imagine the choice you're being asked to make in that situation? You can either have God or you can have a relationship with people. It's a big ask. None of us get asked that question. We don't get asked that question. And yet we demand. We demand before you come into this building that you will repent of your homosexuality. We demand that this behavior has to stop once you know Jesus. 
But I'm a glutton. Ain't nobody cares that I'm a glutton. Dad's in this book. I lie. I drink too much sometimes. I certainly swear. Probably a lot. <laughs> like, like a sailor. Yep, that's true. <laughs> Anybody who's ever played ball with me knows I get mad sometimes. I respond in anger. I have called both Whitmer and Trump names. I'm an equal opportunity destroyer. <laughs> I'm in terrible need of a savior. And yet I blocked the door to the LGBTQIA community. How does that make sense? How does it make any sense at all? We can stand and fight against abortion. We can do that. I'm not saying it's not a horrible thing. What I'm saying is there's a lot of women who've had abortions who need comfort. So we need an ear to say, or they need the ear of God to say you can be forgiven. They need the church. They need Jesus. So instead of shaking our fist and pounding on a podium saying, this is wrong, we need to stop it, what if we were a void, or what if we were the ears for these people? What if they found a safe place here instead of a place that's full of judgment? What if we really believe that life matters, not just unborn life, but all life? These are the things Jesus is advocating for. So what do you do with this? I'm going to be speaking with you over the next couple months, three more times. I have a goal in mind. It's a very clear goal. The goal is, is that today you're listening to me. You have come to hear something. I want you to be standing on this side with me, this side of the counter, giving to the other people who have come into this church who need to find Jesus, who need to know that Jesus loves them, no matter who they are, no matter what they're doing. Their righteousness can only be Christ, just like yours. I want you to join me on this side of the podium and reach out to them and show them a place, whoever them are, that expressly shows them the grace and love of God. No more fighting about pandemics. No more fighting about race. No more fighting about these things. Loving people right where they're at and showing them that Jesus loves them too. I think that's why everybody's found Jesus around. I think that his message is so different than what he said. they've heard from other Christians and other pastors and other leaders that it's attractive because it's doable. Because all they need to do is accept what Jesus has done for them. So that's your challenge, church. You came here today. And some of you have come here not close to God. Some of you have come here close to God. And I want you to remember there's somebody just like you who at one point didn't have this Jesus, didn't know Jesus, and they need him. They need you to be Jesus to them. That's where we're headed. And this is an invitation to join me. Join us. It's not going to always be comfortable. But Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself and love your God. Those two things. That's the new commandment. Judge not, lest you've been judged. Right? It's not your job. God works all that stuff out. <clears throat> all right. Rochelle, you can come out. Thank you guys for your ears today. I'm going to pray. Jesus, I thank you for I thank you for you and I thank you for your passionate love for us. I thank you that you saw our need in the midst of it made a way. And Lord, I just ask you to help us to see that 
The things that divide us are the things that keep us away from you. And help us to truly believe that you are exactly what you said you are. That you are a righteousness and you are our only hope. And Lord, help us to put aside the things that we already believe, that our confirmation bias is to be able to listen to other people, Lord. Give us a growth mindset, a mindset that says, I can learn and I can change if need be. And help us to see others the way you see others. And help me to do that. And Lord Jesus, I just thank you for who you are. I thank you for the people here, Lord. And I just ask you to bother them with this today. Bother them with this sermon until they can't put it down. Bother me with this sermon until I can't put it down. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing here. I thank you for this pandemic. I thank you for listening to our prayers of revival and answering them, Lord. And now, I just ask you to spur us on to do something about it, to take this opportunity that you've given us, and instead of fighting amongst ourselves and fighting with each other, stepping forward and showing the light of the world, which is you, and the hope that everyone can have. Help us not to block the doors anymore. And I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Can you stand with me? Go on and scream 
wrap up, I kind of feel like we went from the field back to the studio. And uh, so now I'm going to, Nick gave us the package and I'm going to put the ribbon on it, which it sounds like I'm saying I'm going to put a ribbon on Nick's package. I won't, say, I won't say that because the pound is a weird image, so don't say that. Um, thanks for sharing what you shared this morning, Nick. And a number of years ago, uh, Ray Comfort, in his best-selling book, Hell's Best Kept Secret, he said the way that uh, most of us here in the West present Jesus is a little like a stewardess on an airliner going around to the passenger saying, I have a parachute. It's, uh, it's the finest parachute that we have. It's made out of great material, and if you take this parachute that I want to give you, uh, it will make your ride more comfortable. And you're thinking to yourself, uh, my ride wasn't uncomfortable. It really wasn't that bad. Uh, but she persists, and she continues to try to sell you on the benefits and uh, all the peace and joy and security that the parachute will bring you. And so finally, reluctantly, you take the parachute, and you put the parachute on, and over time, you realize the parachute isn't that comfortable. In fact, it's kind of disruptive to the flight. It's making you lean forward, um, and all the passengers around you don't have a parachute on. In fact, they're looking at you like, look at that guy. Why is he wearing a parachute? Over time, you're tired of everybody looking at you. You're tired of being uncomfortable, and you take the parachute off, and you're not grateful to the stewardess. You're kind of angry at the people around you, and you don't want to put the parachute back on. And she said, that's kind of the Jesus that we present to our culture. Accept Jesus, and he'll make your life better. He said, but the key to the gospel is that we give people the bad news, the real news. And he said, it's a whole different approach when the stewardess comes to your seat and says, excuse me, uh, we are five miles up in the air, and we just lost three of the four engines. So we are rapidly decelerating and heading for the ground. We are going to crash into Mother Earth. But if you take this parachute, it will save your life. Now your motivation for taking the parachute are considerably different because you're not taking the parachute so that you receive a better life. You're taking the parachute to save your life. And you don't really care if it's comfortable. You don't care about the material it's made out of. You don't care if it was made in China, Mexico, Pakistan, or California. And you don't care if the people around you are making fun of you or not because you grabbed a hold of the parachute to save your life. And so as, written, it, written, as Nick reads through these passages from Jesus, when Nick reads these passages from the Old Testament law, the Apostle Paul said it best. He said, I am for the law, for the reason God gave the law. The reason God gave you and I the law, the Old Testament law, was not to save ourselves by obeying it. The reason God gave the law was to provide a mirror to see our own fallenness. Here's what you have fallen short of. Because unless the doctor shows you the x-ray, you're not going to go in for surgery and let him work on you. And in the same way, unless God shows us our sinfulness, we will never want to put on the parachute of Jesus as our Savior, our only atonement. So if you're here this morning, you have not yet received the gift of that parachute. Receiving the gift of Jesus himself as the substitute for your sin. Make this the morning that you take that conversation with your Heavenly Father seriously. He's inviting you and he's trying to communicate. Maybe you think you're nailing it with your righteousness, but I'm telling you, if you even think about a woman lustfully, if you even, if you even think you idiot, you fool about somebody, you've committed murder, you're trying to say, there's no way to sew your own parachute. Receive Christ if you haven't received Christ. Nick, thanks for sharing this morning.